The A-10 Thunderbolt II is a true marvel of modern military aviation. Known as Warthog by pilots, this aircraft is tailor-made for its role in close air support or case. However, the US Air Force has never fully embraced this jet, which is cherished by many, especially its pilots and the Army. As the weapon detective, we're now investigating the A-10, the combat aircraft that has stood against the Air Force for nearly half a century. Even though many consider it ugly, the A-10 is an iconic aircraft. Even ground troops have said go ugly early on the radio to call the Warthog in for close air support as early as possible during offensive operations. Nonetheless, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and we have to admit that to us, the Thunderbolt 2 is among the most appealing aircraft with its unique charm. If we are a little biased in this video, please accept our apologies in advance. As the A-10 is one of the most well-known aircraft, we skip the program history and design sections and mention some of them during our analysis. The latest single-seat C version of the A-10 Thunderbolt II has a length of 16.26 meters, a wingspan of 17.53 meters and a height of 4.47 meters. Its wing area is 47 square meters. The aircraft's empty and maximum takeoff weights are 11,321 and 20,865 kilograms, respectively. Powered by two 40.32 kN General Electric TF34GE100A turbofan engines, it can reach a top speed of 706 km per hour. The aircraft's range is 4,150 km with a combat radius of 463 km. The service ceiling of the A-10C is 13,700 meters, in other words, 45,000 feet. The aircraft has a 30mm 7-barrel GAU-8A Avenger rotary cannon and 11 hardpoints. The aircraft can carry up to 7.26 tons of ordnance, including AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air and AGM-65 Maverick air-to-surface missiles, as well as bombs and rockets. Why is the A-10 so successful in its role? This type of mission demands high maneuverability at low altitudes to evade attacks from fighters and anti-aircraft missiles, good low-speed flight characteristics, excellent cockpit visibility for hitting small targets on first approach, high survivability, and easy maintenance. The first two requirements dictate a long, straight-wing design with a large area, high aspect ratio, and large ailerons, as variation of delta or sweeping types tend to perform relatively poor at low altitude and low speeds. This design also allows for short takeoffs and landings, enabling operations from semi-prepared forward airfields near the front lines, which is a highly desirable feature for a case aircraft. The A-10's nose shape and canopy design offer the pilot a 20-degree view forward-downward and a 40-degree view to the sides. While its competitors like the YA-9 and the Soviet Su-25 also have survivability features, the A-10 truly excels. For example, its engine placement helps shield from anti-aircraft fire at specific angles and the exhaust gases flow over the horizontal stabilizer, reducing the infrared signatures while maintaining consistent airflow at various angles of attack. The A-10's turbofans are also notable for having a high bypass ratio, making them relatively cold. The Warthog has two tails, allowing the aircraft to maintain controlled flight if one of them or even one of the horizontal stabilizer consoles is lost. Therefore, the A-10's design provides greater survivability compared to single-tail designs like the YA-9 and Su-25. The aircraft also features two independent hydraulic systems with autonomous pumps and two three-phase alternating current generators to ensure it remains operational if one fails. It can fly with one engine, half of the tail, one elevator, and half of a wing missing. You might make some improvements to the overall design to achieve minor enhancement in various areas. Nevertheless, if you want to develop a case aircraft as effective as the Thunderbolt 2, you cannot abandon its core design principles. Therefore, the true successor of the A-10 must resemble it if you want to maintain the same level of efficiency. A stealth fighter capable of supercruise requires a different shape. 
Another reason the A10 has been so successful is because it was designed based on real combat experiences and requirements, rather than some brilliant new concepts that would revolutionize the battlefield forever. Until the early 1960s, the Pentagon believed the next world war would be nuclear. Therefore, the US Air Force favored cutting-edge high-speed tactical fighters, which could drop atomic bombs or intercept enemy aircraft that carried similar ordnance. But the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis showed that trying to solve all problems with the threat of mutual assured destruction was too risky and stressful. Shortly after, the USA became involved in the Vietnam War, which demonstrated that the capabilities of supersonic Century Series aircraft to target point targets on the battlefield were modest at best. Therefore, the Pentagon was compelled to revise its stance on case aircraft. Initially, T-28D nomads armed with light bombs and rockets were transferred to the South Vietnam Air Force. Although the early operations showed promise, the effectiveness of these aircraft diminished rapidly once North Vietnamese forces began using heavy machine guns for air defense. It became clear that a case aircraft, even on low-intensity conflicts, required armor protection and higher speed, which a light trainer could not provide. Therefore, the US Air Force started operating some modified jet trainers, such as the A-37 Dragonfly, specifically designed attack aircraft like the OV-10 Bronco, and modernized Second World War era bombers such as the A-26 Invader. None of them could fulfill the requirement, but they provided invaluable feedback for creating the A-10. So, if the Thunderbolt 2 is so effective at its job, why does the Air Force seem eager to retire it? Although the Air Force operates it, the A-10 is fundamentally a weapon for the Army. The Warthog has served as the guardian angel of the ground units. The distinct sound of its TF-34 GE-108 turbofan engines has not only boosted the morale of friendly forces, but also instilled fear in the hearts of enemies. Unsurprisingly, throughout the A-10's service history, the Air Force's attempts to retire it have consistently faced opposition from the Army. The A-10 was not a state-of-the-art, glamorous, supersonic aircraft. The Air Force has never been fond of this old-school warrior. Nine years after the first Thunderbolt II entered service on March 30, 1976, it initiated a new competition to replace the aircraft and subsequently selected the YA-7F. It was a variant of the A-7 Corsair II fitted with a Pratt & Whitney F-100 PW220 engine and the GAU-13 containerized cannon, a smaller version of the GAU-8. The Air Force quickly abandoned its plan in favor of the A-16, a close air support version of the F-16 armed with a ventrally potted 30mm cannon and reinforced wings. Trials were unsuccessful and the aircraft clashed with the Congress, which ordered the Air Force to retain the A-10 in 1990. The 24 A-16s were later deployed to Saudi Arabia for the Gulf War in a last-ditch attempt to revive the idea. However, their performance was far inferior to that of the A-10. As you may notice, all proposed case aircraft had 30mm cannons. Naturally, the reason was not that the Air Force loved this sound. The successful deployment of the 30mm Dofa cannon by Israeli aircraft against Arab armored vehicles during the 1967 war had been taken into consideration. If it has never liked this aircraft, why did the Air Force initiate the AX program to develop such a case aircraft in the first place? As you may know, all services in the US Armed Forces have their own budgets, leading them to compete for a larger share of the total defense budget. Before the Johnson-McConnell Agreement of 1966, which restricted the US Army's ability to operate combat jets, the Army had considered acquiring several aircraft for the case role, including the Northrop N156F, Fiat G91, Hawker P1127, or the Douglas A4D 2N Skyhawk. In exchange, the Air Force relinquished its claim to use helicopters over the battlefield. Initially, this arrangement seemed satisfactory to both branches. When the Army launched the Advanced Aerial Fire Support System program and subsequently introduced the AH-1 into service in 1967, the dynamics shifted. The Cobra's effectiveness overshadowed the Air Force's A-1 Sky Raiders. Furthermore, the armored units of the Soviet Army in Eastern Europe now possessed new generation tanks and held numerical superiority. 
The 23mm ZSU-23-4 self-propelled anti-aircraft guns also support them. The Air Force found itself unable to meet the new requirements, whereas the Army's helicopters could. Therefore, the Air Force, which saw the potential growth of the Army's aviation role as a threat to its own interests, worried about losing a significant portion of the defense budget to its rival. This concern led to the initiation of the AX program. The Thunderbolt II is an old-school analog aircraft similar to its Second World War ancestor. This design enables the pilots to demonstrate their skills, making the Warthog a cherished aircraft among them. However, in some aspects, it's too old school. The early A-10s lack proper navigation systems. Without modern detection equipment, the Warthog has been involved in some serious friendly fire incidents. Its fighting ability in adverse weather and at night was insufficient. Subsequently, the USA has launched several modernization programs to address these issues. Fairchild Republic even developed the A-10B variant, also known as the A-10NAW. Drawing from the 1982 Falklands War experiences, this version was designed as a two-seater and was equipped with the WX-50 radar, the ANAAR-42 thermal imaging station and the Ferranti-105 laser rangefinder target designator. However, the Pentagon never ordered the A-10B and also blocked its potential sales. Although it proved to be an excellent dogfighter in many exercises, another shortcomings of the Warthog was its inability to fire air-to-air -air missiles. This issue was resolved in 1986 by the integration of the AM-9 Sidewinder for self-defense. The latest modernization carried out from 2005 to June 2011 has equipped the Thunderbolt II with all-weather combat capability, an improved fire control system, electronic countermeasures, smart bomb targeting, and a modern communication suite, including a Link 16 radio and SACCOM. Redefined as the A10C, this version features two multifunction displays, hands on throttle and stick controls, and targeting pods. A10 is a product of the First Cold War in every aspect. By 1984, Fairchild has built a total of 713 Thunderbolt IIs. This number now exceeds the most optimistic expectations of any company for an aircraft designed for a specific mission. Additionally, its cost was only a third of an F-16, something that was feasible at that time. Can anyone envision today's military aviation giants agreeing to produce a combat jet at a third of the cost of an F-35? The A-10 was designed to destroy numerous tanks survive and stay over the battlefield for hours to support ground troops during the Third World War. When the Air Force sent it to do its job, military leaders understood that thousands of anti-aircraft guns, surface-to-air missiles and fighters would be waiting to shoot it down over the Fulda Gap. The F-4G Wild Weasels and the EF-111A Ravens had to escort the A-10s to improve their chances of survival. Given the mission's nature, the Pentagon anticipated heavy losses and estimated that the 7% of Thunderbolt IIs would be lost in each 100 missions. All A-10s would not survive more than two weeks. After the First Cold War, this dire war scenario transformed into a distant memory. Overwhelming Western air power quickly neutralized many countries' air defenses and combat aircraft during various operations, allowing A-10s to complete their missions with relative safety. Now, a new Cold War has arisen. Many believe that the Thunderbolt II is no longer effective in today's era. There are several contradictions to consider. If a total war were to erupt again, could the Western world afford to lose a significant number of expensive fifth-generation aircraft, such as a 700 within two weeks? Would the public accept such losses? If the fifth-generation aircraft could win a potential war within weeks, would it be wise to deploy the F-35s with their excessively high operational costs on low threat level case missions? Of course, some would argue that unmanned combat aerial vehicles and kamikaze drones will inevitably replace the A-10 on the modern battlefield. However, it is worth noting that a comparison of what the A-10 destroyed in Iraq in one month with what the drones destroyed in Ukraine over three years. Despite the Air Force's claims, neither the Army nor Congress has ever been convinced that the F-35 with guided munitions is more effective than the A-10 in the KS role. According to our analysis, 
the Air Force's desire to retire the Thunderbolt II is driven solely by its long-term dissatisfaction with funding the Army's weapon from its budget. Rather than ambitious new concepts designed to shape the future battlefield, as seen in the Vietnam War, cost-effective, combat-proven solutions seem more sensible in this new era which we define as the Second Cold War. Thanks for watching our video and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell button to be notified of our new videos. Also you can now click the join button to support our channel. And as always, we would greatly appreciate all of your likes, comments and shares.